So in the last video, we were seeing how you could represent any set of polynomials as a linear combination of these two base vectors. Well, polynomials of this kind, of course. And we were saying that you can't represent in a uh, natural log of x as a linear combination of these two base vectors. But we were thinking, well, which other base vectors can I use? Um, what can I, and what can it represent in those vector spaces? And um, well, Fourier was thinking about this too. So he came across in the trigonometric function, sine and cosine. He knew about them and he knew this integral. And you can do this integral by your own. You can pause the video and do it. And he realized, well, this seems to be very similar to this definition here. They seem to be orthogonal in this interval from minus pi to pi. They are orthogonal here. But, and, they, and he thought, well, this, they could make for a really interesting base vector, sine and cosine. I could make some very interesting, interesting linear combinations with them. But he then saw that, well, this rule, this, this rule only works from minus pi to pi. I want this rule, what if I want this rule to work in some other interval? And well, that's why I, I have here written this cosine of n times pi times x over l and the same for sine. Because they repeat not every pi radians, but every l radians. You can see here it's this point here, and this is the same as, 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 this, as this point, and they are l, l units, well, two l units apart. They repeat in minus l and l, and the same is true for sine. So this is very useful because I could have, instead of this integral, I could have this other integral. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. The whole point here is that you don't need to have pi, that you can have minus l and l. And you can set l to be any, any value you want. And this integral would still be true. You can do it by your own, or just plug it into Wolfram Alpha, and it will give you this result. And uh, Fourier was thinking, oh, well, so I can have my definition of my dot product, and I can make my definition work in any interval I want. But he then realized, or, well, he discovered that, uh, that he, he wanted to represent any function, any function that you can think of, uh, as a linear combination of trigonometric functions. And he discovered that in order to do that, he needed infinitely many trigonometric functions. Uh, and I'm going to do a pseudo proof of that. It's going to be a, a kind of proof, but not, well, you will see it. I think it's a very good proof. I will definitely prove the, the formulas. Uh, well, the first thing is that he thought, well, I'm going to have this vector space with infinitely many vec uh, base vectors. Uh, my base vectors, are going to have these constants here, 0, here is 1, well, we don't, I don't write it, but here's a 1, here's a 2, and then a 3, a 4, all the way up to infinity, and the same for sine. And I have all these base vectors, and they are infinitely many. And a simpler way to write this is with the sigma notation. And here I have this uh, sum um, of all these, and this would be all my base vectors. And remember that n is a whole number, oh, sorry, this integral only works if n is a whole number. And you have to keep that in mind. Uh, well, and, and here we have the, these are my base vectors in my vector space. And he was thinking, well, which properties does this vector space has? And this, and this vector space has, a very, has some very useful properties. Um, the first thing is that these integrals are zero. You can test them by your own. You can do these integrals. The second thing is that cosine and sine, this, this is, this, these two are always zero. It doesn't matter where n or m are, just that n and m are to, has, are, have to be sorry, uh, whole numbers. And what, do, what does this mean? Well, this means that if cosine and sine are some of some base vectors that I can have, uh, so this means that all my base vectors of cosine and all my base, base vectors of sine are orthogonal to each other, and they always are. 
So that's very useful because this means that all the cosines are orthogonal to all the sines. Also, I can have this other integral that it's a cosine of m times pi times x over l and cosine of m times pi times pi times x over l. And remember that m is some whole number. And if this whole number is different from n, then this is zero. So what does this mean? This means that all the base vectors of cosine are orthogonal to each other. But what if n and m are the same? Then this, this would be like the dot product of a vector with itself, something like this. And you know that this is some, some constant. For example, if I have my vector u to be 4,2, and then I made the dot product of u and, of u, and u would be 4 times 4 plus 2 times, times 2, and this would be, this is 16, and this is 4, so this is 20. This gives, this gives me a constant. And this here too, but and this is always the same constant. This is always L. If they are the same, if this is the same vector, you can see that the same is true for all the sine vectors. And they are all orthogonal to each other. Um, if you do the, the, the dot product of one vector with itself, then you get a constant. Uh, well, all of this because the, well, the thing that makes different one base vector from, from another is the constant they have here. This makes different, this is what identifies every base vector, if, if you want. And by the way, Fourier wasn't just a mathematician. He fought in the French Revolution and in the conquest of Egypt. The guy was an adventurer. But well, let's move on. So, well, Fourier, so, well, I have this vector space, and it has these properties according to the rules that I made up. And he's, he then thought, well, what if I can represent any function, any function I want, I don't know what, uh, this could be anything, any, any, uh, this could be like, I don't know, e to the x times natural log of x, maybe, I don't know, it can be whatever I want. And I'm saying that this function can be represented as a linear combination of my base vectors. Here, a n and b n um, are some constants. Now, let's think how would this look, because, you know, this sigma notation, um, I, I can expand it. I, I'm not obviously going to expand it completely, because it goes all the way up to infinity, but just a little. I will have a0 times cosine of 0 times prime times x over l and b0 and a1 and b1 and it goes on forever. But then you think, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know that this whole thing is going is getting multiplied by 0, right? So this whole thing is equal to 0. The same, the same thing is true right here. And, and so I, I can I have here a0 times cosine of 0, and here I have b0 times sine of 0. But you know that cosine of 0, it's always 1, this is, this is equal to 1, and you know that sine of 0 is always equal to 0, so this is 0. So base b0 is multiplied by 0, so it gets cancelled. This, this whole thing, this whole thing is equal to 0. But this thing is just equal to a0, only a0 by itself, because it gets multiplied by 1. So maybe my easier way to write, uh, sorry for that, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so maybe an easier way to write this would be like this. I have a0 by itself, and all this, inter and all this sum that starts from 1 and goes all the way up to infinity. And the part that where n was 0, it gets simplified to just this. So I'm saying that I can represent any function as some linear combination of these things. So if it were to be false, if it wasn't true, then I wouldn't find an expression for a n and b n, or my expression would make no sense. But if it is true, I will find an expression for this constant, and, and this constant too, that makes sense. So let's see if I can get it. Let's first try to get a zero. So, and I'm going to make it by this way. And first, I'm going to integrate both sides. I'm allowed to do that. 
And I'm going to integrate here from minus L to L. So I apply the, that same, you know that the integrals are linear transformation, transformations. They follow all the requirements to be a linear transformation. So I apply, apply that linear transformation in the other side. So I apply this linear transformation to this whole thing. And well, you know that, well, this is just an integral we can make. This is a constant times dx. You can integrate that. But what if we were to make this? Well, here I would have an infinite sum, like, like this. And I would make an integral. I would be integrating this one, and I would be integrating this one, and, and this one, and this one. I will be integrating all of them. All of them. That, that's what I'm saying right here, that I'm integrating all of them. But you know that, well, this is zero, and this, is, this thing here is just this integral here. But what happens, for example, with this one? Well, we know from, from here, we know from these two, that this will be zero, and this will be zero, and this will be zero, and all of them will always be zero because of this. And you can make this integral, believe me, if you haven't yet. So, I would be, so this whole thing is zero, and the only thing we are left with is just this. So we make this integral, and it's just a zero times x evaluated from minus l to l. So I evaluate this integral, and I get just and I get just a zero times two times l. So I get that this is equal to this here. So if I were to divide by two l then suddenly I have an expression for a0. See? a0 is equal to 1 over 2l times the integral from minus l to l of my function. That's neat. That's a very simple expression to get my, my first term of my linear combination. So let's move on. Let's get all the other ends. But it seems like I am running out of time again, so in the next video I will end proving the formulas for the Fourier series. And I will explain a little of just why, what, what is it out for.